question time. Tonight we're in Tottenham in London on tonight's panel. Crispin Blunt, former army officer, justice minister under David Cameron and former chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Labour's shadow minister for mental health and an A&E doctor who's been working on the NHS front line throughout the pandemic, Rosanna Allen Khan. Victor Adebowali, chair of the NHS Confederation, which represents health providers, former chief executive of the charity Turning Point and a crossbench peer for the past 21 years. Head of Imperial College London's COVID vaccine research and professor of mucosal infection and immunity at their Department of Medicine, Robin Shattuck. And journalist, contributor to Radio 4's Thought for the Day and columnist and leader writer for the Daily Telegraph, Tim Stanley. Welcome to my panel, welcome to our audience here in Tottenham, great to see you and of course welcome to you at home. Do join in the conversation, you know how, the usual way, on social media at BBC Question Time. OK, our first question tonight is from Zoe, Zoe Scott. With rising energy costs expecting to cause a surge in gas and electricity bills, are the government's proposed interventions targeted in the fairest way possible? Yes, the cost of living is going to be going through the roof, I think there's no question about that. Rosanna? I think it's so disappointing for working families up and down the country because now they are going to be seeing these energy hikes. This is on top of rising fuel costs, the uh, weekly shop going up. We're seeing national insurance contributions going up. We've just heard today that the Bank of England expects that inflation will reach 7%. This is having a real squeeze on working people. And I can tell you, as a, as a child who grew up in a home with just one electric heater, I thought that was a time of the past. But now in A&E, when I am doing my shifts, I'm seeing the elderly coming in with electric burns from the same sort of heater because they can't afford to put the central heating on. I'm seeing toddlers coming in, Zoe, with skulls all over their bodies because old water bottles have burst because their families cannot pay the bills. And this government is not doing enough. And in fact, what's really terrible is that this week they had an opportunity to vote with us to actually provide a solution to the issue, which was a windfall tax on North Sea oil and gas companies who have done really, really well out of the situation. And it's important that it goes back in the pockets of the consumers. But and how much do you think you'd get from that windfall tax? What we would get is the ability... So that's... Now how much money do you think you'd get? Well, what we would get is the ability to afford for, for to every family to have £200 off their bill, but for some families to have up to £600 off their bill. We would also cut VAT on um, energy bills for a year starting from April. Crispin. I think the uh, measures are as well targeted as they reasonably can be. £150... Um, for everyone living in a uh, house that's uh, A to D graded for council tax, and then a further £200 uh, off bills from October. And are you happy that that's £200 off bills for everybody? So that's not targeted, that's bills for um, everybody? Yes, but, you, and, but of course that money will be clawed back over the next... By uh, pay later. Uh, over the next, yes, but what we're dealing with here is a, is a shock to the system. Uh, this is a massive global rise in gas prices, which has seen a number of... Uh, energy suppliers go to the wall, whose business models uh, uh, were not capable of, uh, of coping with that. Uh, and we're now in a position where we are going to have to learn to absorb uh, this cost of uh, energy. Hopefully, uh, this is a uh, shock to the system for uh, a relatively short period before the gas prices perhaps then come down to something that is more normal, but we don't know that yet. Uh, and so I think the government's come up with the right policy, a uh, uh, balance between... Uh, 150 pounds targeted at those uh, at, at houses that are at the bottom end of the, of the council tax bans, um, but also 200 pounds uh, off all the bills and 350 pounds uh, combined, combined with all the other measures uh, that are being taken to help address the cost of living. I think is the right uh, balance. Okay, we, we will carry on on this subject. There's a number of hands up, so I'm going to come to you just while I've got you here, Chris, because this news has broken this evening. There have been four resignations from number 10, perhaps the most significant from the Prime Minister's uh, policy advisor, one of his closest, most long-standing and loyal advisor, Manira Mirza. She's written a hugely critical letter of the Prime Minister. What do you make of it? Well, I haven't had a chance to, uh, to, to read the letter. Well, she's called on him to apologise to Keir Starmer. Um, and actually, on that, I think she's mistaken. 
Oh, um, yeah. Because the uh, the apology okay. by Keir Starmer uh, on behalf of the CPS as as DPP uh, precisely parallels the apology by the Prime Minister on behalf of uh, uh, of, no of Number Ten, I'm sorry, where he's rubbish. taking responsibility for uh, the organisation. Um, now, I'm slightly at a loss when people then turn around and say, "Well, this is all absolutely." absolutely terrible. You've got uh, people taking responsibility for the organisation. Well, a number of Conservative they... MPs have been saying exactly that. Well, uh, which is where we've got is to... your colleagues? This is where we've got to divide the, uh, the, responsibility, the responsibility for the, for the organisation, which the Prime Minister has taken, which Keir Starmer took um, for uh, the actions of the CPS as, as DPP. And then we're going to see the, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the inquiries uh, take place. Uh, about the about who was at what party and whether it was a party and what they and what they uh, what they knew or, or didn't know about it or what could okay. reason, reasonably be expected. All right, I was just it. asking about the resignation particularly, uh, Rosie. I just want you to answer that point before I go on to we carry on with the main subject here. Well, it's it's a beggar's belief that we have Crispin trying to defend the indefensible and to actually liken the horrible smearing of. Of Keir Starmer and involve, you know, J you know, Jimmy Savile's victims' families in all of this mess that is quite frankly of the Prime Minister's making. He lied to Parliament. He lied to the country. But he has taken the country for fools. He was at parties. His staff were packing suitcases full of alcohol, working out which spad was going to be the DJ, while people in this room were probably burying well, their well, families. Well, and when I worked, when I worked on the just, NHS front line, taking iPads, when I took iPads to bedside, when I took iPads to the bedsides of dying people, so they, their three children under six could say goodbye, there is absolutely no justification for the pain that they have felt that could possibly be explained away by a um, cheap apology, an insincere cheap apology by the Prime Minister. Well, in that... <laughs> um, uh, in that answer, you have aligned uh, three different things. And I completely understand uh, why you've done it, because obviously it sounds uh, incredibly moving if you've got people it's par truth. apparently parting away in Downing Street. And you've then got uh, NH, uh, NHS staff who did an absolutely brilliant job um, during the, the COVID crisis and, and doing all the things uh, that you uh, uh, explained. Um, but you can't uh, fairly uh, put those circumstances al alongside each other in, uh, uh, if you're actually really being fair about the conduct of Number 10. You need to understand the circumstances inside Number 10, whether people were being were Sorry. brought in. Okay, the rest. But, um, but I could, I'm, <laughs> I'm only too well aware that there will be very few people out there who uh, will be able to put this uh, in the context that I would and then actually come to um, my balanced judgment about the Prime well, Minister. So they're wrong and you're right? Uh, I, people will come to their own conclusion. Okay. But I've come to mine based on what I understand um, of the uh, situation that each of those decision well, makers will have faced. Tim, you wanted to come in quickly, and then I will get back to the main, main subject. I was going to talk about energy, if that's OK. Um, I will give the government credit on one thing, which I think that its proposal uh, of targeted rebates is probably a little more progressive than Labour's idea uh, of a BAT cut, which would affect everyone. So on, I'll give them that. That's all I will give them. Uh, you are now paying for 30 years of failure in energy policy. Sometimes markets go wrong, and this one is going wrong. That's true. But over the course of these three decades, there's been a failure to invest in nuclear, to invest in shale, or to invest in proper gas exploration. At the same time, uh, the Conservative government has nicked some policies from Labour, which themselves have distorted the market, uh, be it the uh, application of a cap onto energy bills, which sounds like a good idea, but as I say, it distorts things, um, and also the levying of green and other social levies, which are added onto your bill. So something like 20% right now of your bill is those levies which have been applied by the government. Now, the government's proposal to, to, to uh, support us during this, at a time in which the average bill is going to rise by about £700, is to give £150 back, I think, uh, via council tax, um, which, is, which is good, but also to give us £200, which, and this is the small print, we have to pay back. So you might call the government's strategy of dealing with a problem which has been exacerbated by government as socialism with a miserly face. <laughs> a socialism in which the government takes your money, gives it back to you, and then asks you to return it. 
And it's so frustrating, after 11 or 12 years of a Tory <coughs> government in power, not just to have this crisis, but to have the same new Labour philosophy at work, a philosophy which sees government money as the government's. It's not. It's yours. And you have lent it to the government. The government shouldn't be lending it to you. OK. Let's come to all this. Green levels, incidentally, I think, are 12.5%, not 20% of the, of the oh, bill. But... No, that's not the calculation I've seen. No, okay. no not just green, social, other levels as well. It's around 20% well. okay. of your bill. Let's hear... Let's, the, the, man, the person at the back there, there we are. Hi. I think surely if the government were sensible, they'd be using the gas crisis as an opportunity to retrofit a lot of the homes in the UK to reduce the demand yes. for gas, yes. which would not only help with fuel poverty, but also help with the coming climate crisis. Um, so I think that would be the long-term solution that they really should be doing. What, installing heat pumps, is that what you're talking about? No, insulating. Insulating, insulating homes to reduce the demand for gas. I mean, that's part of the problem. OK. In, in the blue sweater there, yes. Yes, you. I'd be interested to know why it seems that in the past week there has been less focus by the opposition party upon these cost of living concerns, but has instead primarily focused upon the issues of party gate. OK, and the woman here in the middle. Hi, I mean, you, you mentioned the, um, the, the business models of these energy companies not being capable of responding to this, this shock, this crisis, but these same business models have been robust enough to pay billions and billions um, in shareholder dividends over decades. Um, where, where is, well, when are we start, going to start holding these big corporations to account? When is the government going to start holding these big corporations to account? And of course, Shell was today talking about, uh, or yesterday I think it was, about the size of the profits they're making. And yes, in the, in the blue jacket there. Yes, you, sir. Um, Tim's point about the government policy on green energy, is it time where the government take a step back and start investing in shale gas, which we have in abundance? It's a way of saving some money, um, and we have, we have our own oil and gas, rather than importing it from Eastern Europe, which is very high risk. Of course, and the government did embark on that and then pulled back from it, as you say. So, so Victor, the question is, with the rising energy costs expected to cause a surge in gas and electricity bills, are the government's proposed interventions the fairest way to, to, to help people with their bills? Probably not, actually. Um, and the reason for that is that um, if you're poor, um, this, the, giving everybody the equal amount is fine. If you're middle class, you get a, a bonus. If you're poor, it doesn't really have that impact. And, and it's, not, it's not just the energy bill. You can't just look at the energy bills on their own. You have to look at the hike in food prices as well. And, and you know, the fact of the matter is that poverty costs us in health. The, the impact of poverty on mental health, as Anna would, would support Absolutely this, right. is significant. We've already got 1.5 million waiting on the mental health waiting list. Mm -hmm. There will be an increase in other illnesses, including uh, physical illnesses. So I, I think it's... And it will affect the poor more than the middle classes and the wealthy. That's a fact. So we do need to target the poor specifically. And I would take a balanced approach. I, I actually do think that the energy companies should pay more. They, they, there's going to be a windfall bonus because of the increase, because of inflation. That's a fact. They should pay more. I think it makes sense for the government to actually target, um, over-target those people who are going to suffer the most. I think that's what we do in, the, in this country. Um, and I, I do, I am really concerned about the, the knock-on impacts on, on the NHS. We've just, we, we're just coming out of the worst of the pandemic, only to be faced by another pandemic in a way, which is the pandemic of poverty. And I remember what it's like not to have proper heating. I, I remember, you know, rheumatism. I remember the, the chest infections. I remember all those things. I think we owe it to ourselves as a country to do things like give people back the £20 a week that we took off the poorest people. Give it back to them. Give it back to them. Let's ask You're talking about the, universal so credit. Let's ask, let's ask some, of the, um, some of the energy producers to actually dip dip into the profits and actually share it with the poorest. Now, I know they'll say, if we do that, we take, away from, um, we take away from investments. Well, I'm prepared to take the risk. If we think this inflation will only be around for a year, let's slow the investments um, for a year. If they, think, if, they, if, they say, if they say, and they will say, that means that people who have invested in, in these companies that are paying the pensions won't get the pension dividends. Fair enough. If you're poor, that makes no difference. Let's suspend the dividends for a year. It, 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 no, let's, let's, let's really focus on the human situation here. 
let's invest in our health service by supporting the poor during what will be a horrific crisis of both food yeah. and energy. Well, in the, one of the richest countries in the world, by the way. Woman at the back. On the point of the energy levy um, rebates sorry, being reimbursed, you have to pay that back over a period of time. Yes. So how can you really see that helping individuals and families? Isn't it just delaying the pain? And to Victor's point, it's disproportionately um, impacting the low-income families, those that um, are suffering uh, now and into the future. All right. This woman here in the front. Um, people on benefits don't pay council tax. So if the money is com coming off the council tax, how are they going to benefit to pay their utilities? All right. And yes, the man here in the front. Energy is just a, a piece of the puzzle. Um, Bank of England today said that inflation is going to hit 7% in April. Um, when are we going to be honest about the economic and social damage that we did to ourselves during the pandemic and what we borrowed then to be able to get through it. And you think we borrowed too much? I think perhaps we were a little overprotective, overzealous, and because of that, there are social and economic costs that we're now paying. OK. Robin, are the, are the government's proposed interventions fair, the way to tackle it? The rising costs, rising inflation that we're going to see as well? Well, I think everybody would agree that people shouldn't be having to choose between whether they can eat and whether they can heat their houses, their homes. And clearly, it doesn't seem that it's targeted enough um, or proportionate to give a loan that has to be paid back. Um, there must be a better way to do it, a more efficient way to do it in a, a more immediate fashion. OK, I'm going to move on and take another question. But before I do, just want to let you that next week, that you know, next week we will be in Newport and the week after that we will be in Leeds. And we'd love you to join in and be part of our audience. So if you are from or around Newport or Leeds, do go to the Question Time website. You can follow the instructions there and come and be part of our audience. We'd love to see you. OK, let's take another question now from Paul, Paul Cook. Given the shortage of medical personnel... Should the government abandon its plans to make vaccinations mandatory for NHS staff, as this would lead to even fewer frontline workers? Victor, I'm going to come to you, obviously, as head of the NHS Confederation. Well, we were, we were incredibly worried about the idea of the mandate in the first place, to be honest. Um, my members worked really hard um, to vaccinate as many staff as possible. 95% of NHS staff are vaccinated. Um, there are massive discrepancies depending on where you are and the numbers of uh, black and minority ethnic staff are well below that. My members were working really hard to do that and we, warned the we did warn the government that a mandate would, would potentially risk losing staff at the time that when, we meant, when we needed them most. You know, 80,000 staff. I have a chief exec in London who 17% uh, of his staff would have been, would have been sacked we would have had to close a baby delivery unit. So, you and know, what's the, causing we, the reluctance, do you think? Sorry? What's causing the reluctance, do you think, Victor? Uh, to take the vaccine? Mm. Well, there are a number of factors. Um, the first, one of them is the notion that uh, black and minority ethnic people have been badly treated. They, they, have, they have very good reasons not to trust leadership. Uh, that's a, it's just a fact. It's a painful fact. If you look at the work of the Independent Race and Health Observatory, which studies this stuff, they will tell you that some of the messaging was inappropriate, given by the wrong people at the wrong time in the wrong way. I, I, I'm not one of these people who's, who wants to have a go at people who haven't vaccinated. I, I, I really... Some of people had, had, you know, clear reasons. And many of the NHS staff that aren't vaccinated are working as hard as those that are vaccinated. So I'm not here to have a go. But I do, I do think we did, warn, we did warn the government. What happened was inevitable. So the government's um, taken a step back. The way it did it has caused incredible pain and anguish. If you are a leader of a hospital and you've had to um, basically get your, get your senior staff out there, and I'm sure Rosanna is aware of this, talking to people who haven't been vaccinated, in some cases hundreds of, hundreds of staff, nobody likes, least of all people in the NHS, um, telling somebody they're going to lose the job because they've made a decision. Imagine doing that and knowing the consequences on everyone else. And then they find out that the government's changed its mind, not through a message from the Secretary of State, not through a question, how do we do this? Circumstances have changed, but on the media. Yeah. They find out on the media. 
and then they have to reverse ferret in front of those very staff who built the trust. It's not the way to do this. So I'm glad the government's changed their mind. It was inevitable that they had to do this because of the loss of staff. I'm very concerned about the 50,000 or so social care staff who've already lost their jobs and the cost to charities and companies that provide social care. So they've created a complex problem by not working with us in the first place to actually look at the challenge yeah. properly. That's the problem. We can't afford to lose health and social care staff. And the way the government went about it, I think, has really, well, I know, has really broken the faith of many of those frontline staff in leadership. And that's, that's bad for everybody. OK. Yes, the man at the back in the grey sweater. Thanks. Um, I think you had a point about the messaging. Uh, last week I was watching the news and Clive Marie's report showed about nine out of ten people in ICU were unvaccinated. Should that have been the messaging, more scare tactics, rather than Boris saying, wash your hands, it saves lives, should it have been more showing people actually dying in ICU? I think, if, if I may, I think there are a number of things that, that have been shown to work. First of all, using members of the community in question to give the message actually being present in those communities, spending time with people and going through with them their genuine concerns about, about the virus. I, I, I'm not sure that threats work. The more you no. threaten, the more people tend to, tend to, tend to resist. Um, we do know that the majority of those people in ICU are unvaccinated, and I know because I've spoken uh, to doctors and nurses who have to suffer the moral harm of watching someone die who didn't have to die because they weren't vaccinated. So we have to keep trying. We have to respect people. We have to respect the choices, but keep trying to get them vaccinated. I'll just say one thing. You have a right not to be vaccinated in this country, but what you don't have, in my view, is the right to spread the virus. So you have to take precautions and everybody around you has to take precautions and you have to take responsibility for that decision. All right, it's quite a few hands up. Let's hear from Sophie. Yes, the, the woman in the front here. Um, yeah, I think I would agree with you on that. I think it's really, really easy to brand people as anti-vaxxers. Um, we've just seen in the news that Piers Corbyn is due for trial and things like that. It's very easy to associate people that are reluctant to get vaccinated and brand them in that sort of category. Um, as a medical student myself, um, you know, I've seen it, as I'm sure you have as well, um, up and down the country, different patients for different reasons. Um, saying that they don't want to get vaccinated. In particular, I think the pregnant population really need to be targeted and highlighted here. Yeah. Um, I think in a study of, uh, um, in Scotland, so it's very representative of the rest of the UK, 33% um, of women that gave birth in October 2021 were double vaccinated, compared to 77% of women of reproductive age. So there's clearly a massive discrepancy there, and I think we need to work with people rather than against them to and, try and, and improve Did you have contact with those women or, 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 or people who've not been vaccinated in, as a medical student? Yes, I did, yes. So um, for the last two years, um, I've been on clinical placement um, and I've come across patients that maybe are overweight or have diabetes but seem to be worried about fertility risks or um, uh, the, the fact that the vaccines cause clots and other misinformation that's spread across no, social media or other forms of media. Um, and as well as... Um, uh, personally, I was on ITU um, for a, a, quite a few night shifts, um, mm -hmm. taking care of pregnant women yeah. um, who had been on ITU for about six weeks oh, and had okay. um, babies down yeah. in, the, in the neonatal intensive care unit yeah. um, and hadn't seen them because they'd been on ITU because yeah. of COVID. They hadn't been vaccinated. So I think it is a really important um, point that we do need to work with people, not against them. And Robert, I'm going to come to you to, to talk about a number of those. I mean, there are a number of people in our audience, a few who've not been vaccinated, I mean, do any of you want to contribute to this? To hear, let's hear what, what you've got to say. Yes, in the, in the red sweater there. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to thank uh, Victor for making his points because I think he's the first person who has um, considered the rights of people who aren't vaccinated and talked about whether someone has the right to take the vaccine or not take the vaccine, as opposed to the sort of balance sheet that is argument that's presented. Do we lose X number of healthcare workers or do we gain... I don't know, um, you, you understand what I mean. Do, what is the effect of that? What's the benefit? And we aren't quite asking the question, what rights do individuals have? In terms of um, misinformation, uh, this lady says, for example, I don't know, um, there's misinformation about blood clots and other side effects. But the truth is that this vaccine does have some fairly horrific um, side effects. And we don't, we're operating with incomplete data. So we don't know how widespread those are. But for young, healthy people, I think there's a fairly 
reasonable argument to say that the side effects or potential side effects are worse than the uh, possibility for harm from the disease. And you know, also the swine flu vaccine was recalled after about 800 cases, I believe, of uh, narcolepsy in children. And there are far more cases of adverse reactions from this vaccine than the swine flu vaccine. Yet I don't feel like there's an open conversation about the side effects, the potential risks, especially to young people and especially for children. OK. Uh, Robin, would you like to take that? I, I'd like to start first with differentiating vaccines for healthcare workers and vaccines for the general population, because I think they're two different issues. And, and when we talk about the healthcare staff, I think everybody who works in the health system has a duty of care. And that duty of care, first of all, is to do no harm. We do know that vaccines reduce infection, they reduce transmission, and I can see no logical answer for somebody who wants to make sure that they're not potentially harming individuals, either by spreading the virus or putting them by undue stress by the fact that they know there are healthcare staff who are resistant to getting vaccine in those frontline working roles is a significant issue. Now, the way to persuade them is probably not through making it mandated. I think the, the, the actual evidence for the safety of the vaccine and its efficacy in a healthcare setting is so overwhelming. Would you want to address this, man's words? Because you've chosen not to have the vaccine. Uh, I'm right, aren't I? I'll be correct, yes. So, I, I mean, I have great respect, particularly for people who have, who have questioned, uh, and science is all about questioning the evidence. Um, scientists spend their life, I spend my life looking at evidence and questioning it. First of all, one thing is really important to recognise is there are a range of vaccines out there. They don't all have the same side effects. Um, the other thing to remember is, uh, you know, obviously comparing it to the narcolepsy story, which actually it worked out in the end that it, it wasn't so related as people thought. We have far more safety data based on the current vaccines because they've now been in billions of people. And the evidence is there and accessible. So if you want to do a data analysis and look at the risk ratio and hazard ratios, you can get those numbers. There's no secrecy around it. So if we talk about serious adverse events, they are extremely rare. Now, the two main vaccines that are currently used in the UK are the two RNA vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer. They are the rarest events of any serious concern is inflammation of the heart, which happens mainly in young men and teenagers. It's extremely rare, very unlikely to happen, and nobody actually has had long-term consequences of it. The most people who have some adverse event are mild injection site reactions and maybe a day of feeling slightly unwell. Um, and, and the evidence and the facts are there. Um, they're indisputable. OK, no, I... Uh, I sorry, can I, can I speak? Is yes, right? cool. please. Um, no, I mean, um, I, I appreciate that, and I've looked at the data myself. I mean, the data I, I believe you're talking about is the yellow card reporting scheme, which are, which are well, self-reported. More than just the yellow card. Fair enough, OK. Obviously but looking most... at it on a global basis. Uh, well, OK, fine. But um, most of the data in the UK, for example, comes from the yellow card reporting scheme, which is a self reporting scheme. There was a select committee in 1999 which estimated that there was an under-reporting factor. So roughly only about 10 to 15 percent of cases get, uh, uh, you know, referenced. And with the AstraZeneca vaccine, it's not simply, um, you know, uh, uh, inflammation. Um, What's interesting here, listening to you, is, is you've got uh, Robin here, who's a, a world-renowned mm -hmm. expert, yes. developing vaccines, researching vaccines for HIV mm -hmm. and Ebola. He's giving you information he's giving you. You're mm -hmm. going through your notes, finding all sorts of other things. Mm -hmm. Is nothing he says credible to you? Well... Given how... Okay. What an eminent scientist he is. No, sure, sure, sure. No, of course it is. Um, I studied philosophy at university, and I learned that an appeal to an authority is not an okay. automatic win of an argument. And if we want to appeal to authority, for example, we could talk about someone, say, Robert, Dr Robert Malone, who is the man who invented the vaccine, who suggests that people, okay. young people, for example, no, he's, don't take he's, it. He's, I don't think he is the man who invented the vaccine. He was, he was critical inventing mRNA vaccines. Let's let Robin okay. answer that, and okay. then I'll come uh, to that, some that, other that, people in the audience. That, that has 
It's nonsense. He didn't invent okay. mRNA vaccines. He, the, the people who developed the vaccines, the two RNA vaccines, are BioNTech, uh, the, the company invented RNA vaccines, and the other group are Moderna, and it's based on their research. Hmm. Rosanna? It's not based on an individual. Rosanna, let's, let's, let's bring you in here. You're so right. the question is about mandating vaccines, yes. and obviously the importance of persuading people. Yes, so first of all, I, I would say that I do really believe that our best defence against this virus is to take the vaccine. Of course, I respect personal choice not to take the vaccine. But I can tell you that any medication, a box of paracetamol or ibuprofen, will have a list of the most common and the most serious side effects. There isn't a single drug or vaccine that doesn't have one. What I can tell you is the devastation and heartbreak of working in an intensive care where you see row after row after row of patients fighting for their life, where you then have to pick up the phone and communicate with their loved ones and pass on messages. And if there is anything, anything that can be done to spare people that visceral, palpable pain I think it should be done. But to come on to the point about NHS staff, the principle of when you go to medical school or you study to be a nurse or a physio or, or anything within our NHS is it's actually a vocation, not a job. And we believe in doing no harm. And of course, it's important to take a vaccine because you don't want to harm your patients. But it's also important to understand the, how essential proper staffing levels are. And if you lose any more staff, we came into the pandemic 100,000 NHS staff short. We lost last year between July and October 27,000 staff in the NHS due to mental ill health. If you are bringing your mum into the A&E of, an, of, of a night and she cannot get her stroke treatment within a four hour window because there are no staff, she's going to die. So when we look at the principle of do no harm, we have to understand that there is a workforce issue at the same time. And I'll just finish by saying there are communities who are vaccine hesitant. And I understand why they are. Because when I talk with these rows and rows of beds in intensive care, it's our frontline workers from our poorest and black and minority ethnic group backgrounds who are in these beds, our posties, our bus drivers, our shop market, shop workers, and these are the people who feel most let down by the government during the pandemic. It's very difficult for them to then trust someone who breaks all the rules to say, yeah, take our vaccine. You'll be fine. You'll be safe. Of course, they're going to have questions. And my dad was dying in his care home last year. And the very best people I've ever met in my life were the black um, carers that were looking after him. The best people I've ever met. And they were vaccine hesitant because they said they felt so let down by the government and they genuinely felt as though they may become infertile and they just needed to be persuaded a bit. And I think persuasion is better than forcing people by threatening them with job loss. There's lots of hands. I'm going to get round as many of the audience as I can. Uh, yes, the woman there in the beige top, yeah. Um, I think that um, the vaccine should be an individual choice. I live in my body. I know how my body works and I feel like I'm best informed to know how I feel I may fight COVID. I think we need to move away from this narrative of black and ethnic minorities all don't trust the government and that's the reason why they're not taking the vaccine. I, for one, have made an individual choice. I'm not, anti I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I've persuaded my family members who are vulnerable, who I deem vulnerable, to take the vaccine. However, for me personally, Someone who's even had COVID and it was just a headache and a lower back pain and I was able to ride it through, right? For me personally, I'm fine. And, you know, I was a bit hesitant to even speak about this subject tonight because some of my close friends, I only told three people, but a lot of them said, Dami, don't mention that you're not vaccinated because when you go back to work, mm. people are going to look at you like you smell. And I think it's really bad that, you know, we're, we're deemed the bad guy for not, be, being vaccinated. Um, you know, when I did get COVID, 
I isolated, not for 10 days, 12 days, right? I made sure I was away from everyone. I'm responsible enough to do that. And I, I, I accept that some people are not responsible enough. But what I do find really annoying is the attack on us all the time for choosing what we know best for ourselves. That's where I stand. And, you know, it is quite painful and it is quite a difficult decision to make because before I got COVID, I was very anxious about how will it affect me if I do get it? Were you worried that you might end up in hospital, for example? So I was never worried I'd end up in hospital, but I was worried that I might be sicker than I ever have been. I'm, I'm someone who, thankfully, have, has not really experienced any sickness. I'm pretty healthy. I don't even get the cold or the flu. I don't even get headaches. And just to finish up, it's interesting that you spoke about paracetamols and um, ibuprofen, how they have side effects. Actually, as an individual, when I am going through pain, I tend not to go to those things. I get, tend to go to natural rem remedies. Okay. So fair that's just enough. me. Yeah. Do you get what I mean? It's fair enough. All right. Yeah. Okay, we'll come to your point. I'm just going to get around a little bit more of the audience. Yes, this man here in front. I think we like, talked a lot about vaccines, and we know they have like, a massive impact on like, reducing harm. I think one thing which doesn't get discussed so much is the natural immunity. I don't know if we look to like, Israel early on in their Green Pass, if you had had a positive tests, and that counted. And I just think I completely understand why we're trying to reduce transmission, reduce harm by vaccines. I just think the conversation of natural immunity should be raised more often. OK, we'll come to that as well. Yes, the, the woman at the very back. Why have we been so slow to roll out vaccines to children? Surely that's an important component to keeping the kids in the classroom and making up for lost time. All right. And the man in the um, uh, maroon top there, yes. Anrak at the back. Yes, you, sir. I think vaccines should absolutely be a personal choice, but this idea that I know what's best for my body doesn't make a lot of sense to me because I don't. I'm not a doctor. I think when there's something wrong with me, I go to the people who are experts in that field. You OK. And the guy in the blue sweater, yes. Perhaps adding to that as well, I've read recently that there have been cases where doctors or uh, uh, religious leaders or co uh, community leaders would have one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one chats with people that were against taking the vaccine. And because they had a lack of knowledge or scientific evidence upon it, after having this chat with a one-on-one -on -one, uh, professional, they then changed their decision and went from being neutral or against it to being for having a vaccine. So perhaps that's a better way of going forward rather than creating this division between, um, between gr ethnicity groups, but rather focusing on specific individuals one by one and slowly getting more traction. Robin, what about this idea then? As, as you were saying, you know, you feel you know what's best for you. Uh, and we've heard talk about natural immunity as well. So I think the, the issue here is that it's not just about personal choice. I respect personal choice, and of course you can make your own decisions. But it's a bit like people wearing masks in the audience. You're not just getting vaccinated to ensure your own health. It's about ensuring everybody else's health. And so if you were vaccinated, you would be much less likely to get reinfected and much more less likely to pass it on to others. And it only works where everybody contributes to reducing transmission in the community. And, and uh, natural immunity? And, and natural immunity... So the, the difficulty with natural immunity is if you've had COVID, you don't know how good an immune response you've developed. And we're all different individuals. Some of us will have a mild infection and may get a good response. Some of us may have a very poor response. So in the context of vaccination, that will boost the response that you got from natural infection and give you protection for much longer and make you less susceptible to become infected. And if you do become infected, because the vaccines are not perfect, and I don't think we should pretend they're perfect, but they do work to reduce it on a population basis, you're again less likely to be infectious for a prolonged period of time. This man here in the front. Can I go back? Obviously, the original question was about vaccines. Um, I've experienced, because I, I, I was a nurse, I'm now retired. But I came out of retirement and I did some agency nursing. What that was involved for three months, for three years. In the wintertime, I went round hospitals, around a trust, and I vaccinated staff with the flu vaccine. Uh, so I came across, you know, charge nurses who weren't black. They were, you know, part of the, the, the trust who wouldn't have the yeah. vaccine. You know, even though I explained to them that, you know, they're looking after people who were in front of them, the patients, 
who they could give this to. They wouldn't have this. Mm -hmm. And it was doctors, yes. physiotherapists, you name it. Yeah. We tried incentives, like giving away free pen. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds daft, but, you know, pens. We tried a competition for an iPad, to try and win an iPad. That didn't work. Um, so I don't know how we expect to get anyone to come in to take more vaccines um, when, you know, we've reached that stage now where, as you were saying, most of the, the population in the hospital have had the vaccines. And you've got this small percentage. Um, I'd like to know what the panel thinks on that. Tim. First of all, congratulations to Question Time for even having this conversation. Yeah. There are some people who think that these questions simply shouldn't be aired. Uh, and not only does that treat people like children, but it also means that if you don't ask the questions, you won't necessarily get the answers. And that means that the questions percolate out, out there, and it means people are, again, likely to stay away from having vaccines. So until we start discussing this openly, I think the situation is going to continue as it is. Secondly, on the subject of mandating uh, NHS staff, um, I was very struck during the parliamentary debates over this by something said by Caroline Lucas, and she'll have to forgive me, the Green MP, she'll have to forgive me here for paraphrasing, but she said, when you start mandating things, you switch from something that is done by the community to the community. And that's a transformation, and the consequence of that is more likely to be resistance than uh, people going along with it. I think in general in life, as far as you can, you should reason and argue and debate with people rather than imposing something on them. And finally, on the moral point, um, I mean, the gentleman with his degree uh, in philosophy, uh, which, which is a, a good thing to have, by the way, but of course it won't protect you from a virus. Um, whereas degrees in medicine are, are probably much more useful in that regard. Um, but I, I take the point about the, the risk of passing it on to someone else or the risk of taking up a hospital bed. And these are, these are sound moral questions that imply that taking the vaccine is the altruistic thing to do. But I, as a member of society, also have to consider the dignity of the individual and their right to refuse something to be done to them. And whenever you impose something on people, whenever you take away particularly bodily autonomy, you are denying the personhood and the dignity of that individual. And when society takes that step, that's a step away from freedom too far for me. And the last two years, we have seen an extraordinary growth of, st of the state, an extraordinary rollback of civil liberties. If we could emerge out of this with a voluntary vaccine program and with as much liberty as possible, that for me would be the best possible outcome. I am very reluctant to go down, to continue down this path of telling people what to do. Because ultimately, what is the point of living? What, what, what is the value of life if not to be free? I would rather live in a society. I'd rather live in a society that is free than live in one which which is uh, curtails one's liberties to that extent. That makes me very uncomfortable, and that, that that's a kind of state that is almost not worth living in. Okay, I'm going to take a couple more points. And I'll go. Yes, the man at the very back. So um, I was working as a volunteer vaccinator uh, in my community for a brief period of time, and I was fortunate enough to talk to people who I was vaccinating about their concerns about having the vaccine. And a lot of the time, it, it was people from ethnic minorities who had believed that the COVID vaccine was not made for them and it was not made with the intention to be for them. And a lot of misinformation was able to spread around their communities and they felt that the messaging was never targeted towards them mm. to convince them that this was something that they should be having. Mm. So is there anything that the government or any policies that should mm. occur to encourage people to get this? Victor, do you want to take this? I'll come to you, Chris. Yeah, in a moment. just on the facts, just in case, you know, n <coughs> vaccine take-up amongst um, NHS staff, as I've said, was 95%. So, you know, most NHS staff took it. When you look at black and minority ethnic um, NHS staff, it's 69%. So that, that, those are facts, right? And um, as I've said, there are things that we, we can and should and are doing to encourage those staff to take up um, the vaccine. Um, uh, we've, we've said engaging those community leaders in understanding the, the facts and then explaining it, um, making uh, the vaccine uh, present in their community through buses and, and, and constantly acknowledging their concerns and bringing those concerns to the fore. Um, we need, the NHS is not, um, uh, if you look at the leadership of the NHS, 
uh, there are very few black people in leadership positions in the NHS. That affects, you know, what, how messages are presented uh, to black and minority ethnic staff. So there are things that we can do. There are things that we should do. I do think just on this uh, point of, of freedoms, I, I, it's a bit, you know, you do have the freedom to do a lot of things. You don't have the freedom to shout fire in a crowded restaurant, for instance. No, you do. And, you and, just have and, to suffer and, the consequences. Yes, that's my point. Yes. That's my, you've made my point for me. Yes. And the, the point is that it's not just you that suffers the consequences, it's everybody else in the restaurant. So I, I just think that we need to be, we need to be really clear about the individual responsibility. You have the individual right, absolutely, but you also have the individual responsibility to understand the consequences of that choice on other people. You are more likely to spread the vaccine. You are more likely to end up in, in hospital. The, these, these are facts. So I, I just think we need to be, let, you know, I, I'm tech, bring down the temperature. Let's understand the facts. Let's help people understand the vaccine. Okay. You are better off taking it than not taking it. All it's right. just, that's, those are the facts. Listen. But can I just say, on, on, no, can I just say on this point I about morality of being... I just need to let Crispin back in, Tim. Crispin's not had a chance to speak yet. You, okay, sorry. Let me Jeffrey. just let Crispin speak. Um, I agree with uh, Victor and the points he has been making. Uh, but uh, it's not as though the government has not been supporting uh, ethnic ambassadors to actually make the case on vaccines uh, into, into the community. They have been. Uh, the government have had to uh, consider the... Uh, the emerging evidence in uh, where the science has been developing and the evidence has been uh, moving at quite a pace as, as uh, decision points have to be taken. And so uh, where I think we're at is the, uh, the question of compulsory vaccination uh, within the NHS and previously it was compulsory vaccination uh, in the care sector. Uh, for my money, I think the, uh, given the evidence that was available to ministers making that decision, I think they made the right decision about the care sector. Uh, they're now faced with the same decision about the NHS and uh, they're now, now, it, it now appears uh, that the uh, evidence around Omicron and how much less lethal it is than uh, its predecessor uh, versions of the vaccine, that it's now time to, okay. uh, re to reassess. So should those uh, that, care that, workers that, that get is their what, jobs That back? is a sensible way of proceeding on the basis of as much evidence as possible uh, and then to take okay. the, uh, the decisions uh, at the time. And of course right. there's an issue about... Uh, uh, the prospect of making uh, vaccines compulsory, uh, I hope, will have had its own effect uh, on uh, people in the care sector right. and now in the NHS going... I'm going, well, to, I'm going to move on a minute, but before I do, I just wanted, before I finish this topic and move on to a completely different one, you wanted to come back in. Yeah, do, so you mentioned um, natural immunity, right? And, you know, the way the approach of the government is that there's only one way to solve this, which is vaccines. Why are we not doing more? Like, for example, I've tried to get an antibody test to see, you know, if I've got any natural immunities and stuff like that. Why are we not pushing that if people and are, you, are... Given what Rob has just said about natural immunity, has that not made any difference to your thinking? No, because I think... I don't know, I just feel like... I think it's not the same for every person, and I think that you should try and just explore that for, for people who... Um, who just choose not to, and maybe right. that might be a solution to your NHS crisis. Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm, just, I'm only because I'm going to move on. Yeah. Robin, a final word. I mean, I think that the issue is natural immunity is very variable. You can't, on a mass population basis, go around and measure everybody's antibody levels. And if I measured your antibodies levels today, and I could say that it was below a protective threshold, would that persuade you to go and get vaccinated? It could. And, 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 and it and could, and that's the, probably the why issue. I wanted to do it. Right. But it's so difficult to get it. Like, what's the whole? Why are we? Why are we spending so much on the vaccines, and we're not allowing some people like me who wants to just see? You know. So it could actually. Okay. Let, let him answer. So the the important thing right now is we don't know. We don't have a precise unit of if you have an antibody level at this level, you are protected for this number of months. So the day that you get your antibodies measured will give you some idea of your immune response, okay. but it won't tell you how long that lasts. If you get a vaccine, which I can tell you all the evidence shows is completely safe, your risk from the vaccine, the risk from the vaccine um, is so low to you and the benefits are so high that it would boost your immune response and give you the security that those vulnerable members of your family who you've persuaded to get vaccines for very real reasons, you are not going to be passing on that, the virus to them. You're going to be better able 
to protect them. OK, I'm going to... I'm just... I'm, I know we could talk about this for the entire programme. I want to talk about it for a good chunk, which I think we have. But so many of you asked about this next point that I'm going to... I would be remiss of me if I didn't get it in. So let's hear from Hasiba, Hasiba Bakari. Is Boris Johnson causing irreversible damage to the reputation of the Conservative Party in order to save his own position? Yes. Right. Now, we've been talking about this for a lot of weeks. Uh, we haven't got an awful lot of time left on the programme, but as I say, so many of you put in questions about this. I felt we had to tackle it again. There have been, as I say, what, four or five resignations uh, today, this evening. Crispin. We are plainly going through um, a, a huge... Uh, crisis in terms of confidence uh, in the Prime Minister and the, and the government, as it's presented uh, in the media around uh, the pattern of behaviour in Downing Street uh, and the Cabinet Office uh, over the last uh, two years. Uh, no one should uh, deny that. Uh, but what is sitting behind that is the Prime Minister's former Chief of Staff, um, who has then, uh, uh, sitting there, uh, leaching out a bit by bit information into the media. So you're talking about Dominic Cummings, obviously. I am. Because um, uh, his who... current chief of staff has just resigned. Well, I'm talking about Dominic Cummings. Right, OK, just so um, we're clear. And, uh, uh, and uh, we are seeing um, the media then uh, cheerfully uh, uh, picking all this up and then and the stories uh, then are coming out bit by bit. By bit. You have to ask yourself um, uh, uh, whether or not uh, we're being played here. Oh, um, and I think that we are, and we should understand the circumstances. Now, none of that um, uh, means that we shouldn't be uh, conscious about uh, the effect it has on people who have uh, very properly followed the rules very precisely um, and, uh, and then uh, understandably extremely cross. You did say you they, thought quite what, a few people probably they, hadn't followed the rules earlier. Saying. Sorry? You did say you thought quite a few people probably hadn't followed the rules earlier. Indeed. But, I mean, but, but a lot of people would have done. Um, and it's those people who, who I can understand their, uh, their, their real annoyance. Um, but I'm not saying, hang on a minute. Uh, we have to be reasonably quick, take, Crispin, forgive uh, me, right, just because okay, we haven't got an awful lot of time. I think it's, it's necessary for yeah. us to actually have a bit of perspective here. Um, about exactly what we are charging okay. uh, the Prime Minister with. So let's just take a step back. Oh, no, no, hang on, Christian, because otherwise no one's going to get a word in edgeway. So, uh, Tim. Uh, the, the Conservative argument for the last couple of weeks has been we need to stop talking about the Prime Minister and talk about the other ways the country's in a mess, uh, like inflation or like energy bills and things like that. As well as I Boris, Boris Johnson is a phenomenon. I'm among, uh, Boris Johnson is a phenomenon. I'm amongst a minority uh, who, who rather likes him, actually. And, and he reminds me of a character in an Ocean's Eleven film where technically he may well be a con man and he might be the bad guy, but you want to see if he gets away with it. Are you saying he's like and George how Clooney? He did it. Um, or Brad Pitt? But, Which but one are you choosing? <laughs> <laughs> but what I, what I would say is that the way you framed the question was very interesting. What damage is he doing the Conservative Party? And you've got to understand that this is why it's difficult for the Conservative Party to decide what to do about him. Because the Conservative Party suspects that the reason why it has its majority is Boris Johnson that he is the only man who could have got Brexit done and won the Red Wall, and they're worried that if they get rid of him, they're actually going to get rid of the one thing that possibly makes the Conservatives competitive for the next election. So I think they move on Boris uh, Johnson at their risk. Okay. And a part of me still thinks he might get away with it. He might pull off one more great con. Rosanna. And we're all going to have to be quite brief, forgive me. I think the issue is not about the irreparable damage he's doing the, to the Conservative Party, it's about the irreparable damage he's doing to the country. He wasn't even fit to lead the country before we went into the pandemic. We've got to remember his track record of homophobia, racism, sexism, misogyny. He got... He got... He got... He's an absolute consistent liar. He's, the people closest to him are now jumping ship. There is absolutely no way he should stay. He missed five Cobra meetings. He said, let the bodies pile high. He okay. doesn't care about us and the country now know it. Victor. Um, well, I think there are three things that are problematic. The first is the moral vacuum at the top of the government. I mean, there is a, you know, there's, there's a moral vacuum. The second is I have to tell you, as a, as a father, I, I was brought up to tell the truth, take responsibility yeah. and search truth and, and to look for that in the examples of leadership. And what do you tell your kids? 
when, when, you look, when they look up and they see a kind of game being played out. You know, your analogy is very entertaining, but this is the country. And, it, and it's not just about the politics, it's about the moral leadership. It's about, it's about that stuff. So if you want to make the political point, this is what's happened, is people might not have known who Keir Starmer was, frankly, they do now. And even if you replace Boris Johnson, whoever replaces them has now got a, actually an opposition which people kind of know about, partly because of the sort of error. That it's not just an error, it's, it's, it's moral leadership. It's not just about the parties, it's about how you stand. It's about, do you have values? Do you have a moral compass? That's what's important here. And I, I just worry about it turning into a kind of game. It's more important than that. It's about whether we have leadership which has a set of values, has a moral compass, yeah that can actually be an example to me, you, right. and our children, and okay. young people who want to enter politics. OK, I so want to hear from the audience as well, Victor, otherwise I'll never get them in. Yes, the woman in the red dress. <clears throat> I find it quite ironic you're talking about us being played. Absolutely, we've been played, but um, that's not by Dominic Cummings, that's by our Prime Minister. Mm. Dominic Cummings may be drip, drip, dripping, but it's all truth. Exactly. It's all truth, what he's telling us. Yeah. It's not fabricated, it's not made up. And the fact that... You know, he fired the person that knew where all the bodies were hidden. Well, there we go, that's what happens. Robin. I mean, I think that the, the issue is, for me, that integrity matters and so does the way people behave. And, and many of the issues we talked about tonight relate to trust. Who do you trust in terms to give you a truthful picture of the situation? And whatever you feel about the current situation, it's only made it a lot harder to communicate the core messages that people need to, say, need to hear. We know that from a recent publication, the, the people who are least willing to get vaccinated are the people who least respect people in public office and the government. And that's only made the job that much yeah. harder. But at the same, at the same time, I, I, I obviously, it, it, one shouldn't have to say integrity is important in public life. It plainly is. But we've had prime ministers who have been, have been paragons of morality, like Theresa May, and she was rubbish at the job. Uh, we had Tony Blair, who was directed by a kind of inner, almost religious morality, and he took us to war. Uh, some people calculate that, look, they might not internally trust Boris Johnson, but he gets stuff done. He got yeah, but... Brexit done, he got the vaccine done. And they'd like to see if he can do levelling up and how to much be, he can actually achieve. To be fair, mm. to be fair, um, he made a dis some decision. The NHS got the vaccine done, credit where credit's yeah, due. Yeah, exactly. And oh, I don't think... I think the problem is, you know, we've got this Prime Minister, not the last Prime Minister's. Two wrongs don't make a right. We need to deal with the situation that's facing us. And people's anger and, and frustration is because of the moral vacuum. That's oh, the problem. Oh, okay. Do you know, I think we might end up talking about this... On other programmes as well, what do you think? Because I'm tired of coming, I don't know, I have no crystal ball. But that is all we've got time for this evening. Thank you very much, my panel, for coming this evening. Thank you to all of you for coming here and making your points. Much appreciated. And, of course, thank you to you at home for watching. From Question Time in Tottenham in North London. Bye-bye. <laughs>